at the end of the day, the goal is to produce the highest absolute watts that we possibly can. So it's no longer watts per kilogram, it's not watts per CDA, it's just absolute watts and that, that's what we're chasing here. The standard that we're looking at at the moment is for over a thousand watts for 30 seconds, uh, over 540 watts for four minutes, and 440 to 450 watts for for the 20 minute mark. That's, that's sort of like our standard of like, let's have a chat. Welcome to the Training Peaks Coachcast. I'm your host, Dirk Friel. In each episode, we'll sit down with industry experts to discuss coaching methodologies, the latest research, and leading tools for endurance training. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources. My guest today is Ben Day, who is a retired pro cyclist and founder and head coach at Day by Day Coaching. Ben has one of the most unique coaching positions in the world, as he was recently hired to be the head of performance for the American Magic Boat, which will compete in the America's Cup in September 2024. Ben describes his fascinating journey from pro cyclist to head coach of Tour de France teams to the New York Yacht Club and gives insights into why and how cyclists are now an integral part of the America's Cup boats. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and can learn a bit more about what it takes to compete in a sport where technology innovation and endurance athletics come together to allow boats to fly out of the water at 100 kilometers per hour. Ben Day, I've known you a long time. I think I go back, I'm thinking maybe 15 years or so at least. I mean, you know, I didn't quite race with you. I retired in 2002 from pro cycling. You went on a number of years. You were kind of just starting then almost, I think. Um, but I remember you, you know, I was in Australia with you, um, at some training camps, tour of California. I was embedded with a team that you competed on. Yeah. You had amazing results back then, had a great pro cycling career, but we're here today to talk about yacht racing and how the heck does a pro cyclist turn cycling coach make his way to head of performance you know the boat being America's magic, American magic, and uh, yeah, give give us uh, kind of a, this this uh, really cool adventure that you're on, and how do you make that transition from, from pro cyclist to uh, yacht racing coach? Yeah, it's a little bit of a serendipitous journey in a way, and uh, a wild ride, I have to say. Uh, yeah, so after I started day by day coaching during my professional cycling career. Um, and as you know, like we've been involved together so long with um, early iterations of Training Peaks <laughs> um, back in the early versions and stuff like that. And I've been a, a long time user and knowing you through through that and, and training together out in, in Boulder, which is I still classes home and I, I miss it. Uh, yeah, and so after retiring from racing, uh, I eventually worked for um, Mitchelton Scott, they've been called a few different things, Green Edge Cycling, so World Tour team currently known as Jaco Alula. Uh, so it's been based in over in Girona, Spain for the last four or five years and that's been a great experience and you know, I really love uh, the high performance level of, of all sports, not just not just cycling in itself. Uh, to, just to have the, the, the resources available to be able to push performance in, in all certain areas of, of like an athletics um, holistic preparation, you know. So yeah. that, that's been, you know, always something that has driven me a lot. But if I rewind back a very long way, before I even became uh, a decent cyclist, I was just sort of like getting into it. I used to go out on my dad's boat all the time. I used to go out every weekend. And it's in not Australia? very conducive. In Australia, yeah. yeah. Morton Bay, yep, off the coast of Brisbane. Morton Bay, 365 islands, one for every day of the year. Uh, and I remember, you know, it wasn't very conducive for training. I took my my old uh, rim-powered ergo out there once, put it on the top of the boat, and I'm rocking around like this, and it wasn't very good. Yeah. didn't work very well, and then everything, <laughs> everything got very rusty very quickly. Um, long story short, you know, something that I loved back then, and I promised myself when I finished – uh, racing bikes that I would circle back around and, and have sailing or sailing and boating in my career again, and so it's become it's become something that has been you know something to to feed my soul my my sort of own purpose outside of the professional um, pursuit of professional cycling coaching and things, and so yeah I've been away doing sailing trips for, for the last four five six seven years and and own 
um, my own boats as well. I'm sitting on one right now. Nice. Um, getting ready for a race next week. I've never done an uh, interview so with somebody on a boat. It, where Where yeah. is this boat? Where are you docked? Get, yeah. Give us a little more yeah. color to where you're at. We're in the Hamble River, uh, close to Southampton in the UK, so south of London. Okay. And this is this area is called the Solent, and it's probably the mecca of, of, of sailing in all of the UK. And the, the the history of sailing in the UK is 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 massive. So there's boats absolutely everywhere here. Yeah. Uh, it's blowing sideways at the moment. It's huh. uh, not very pretty out there. Um, good for sailing, not good for sitting on the beach and catching a tan. So yeah. that's where I'm at right now, getting ready to do a, a race on the boat next week. Wow. Um, but yeah, just to, to circle back around to that, it's like something that's been good for my soul, good for like, it's a thing that I sort of give back to myself is, is, is this little endeavor. And last year I was given an opportunity uh, by my colleague at uh, American Magic to come on board and to lead the performance uh, department and to help recruit cyclers to, to ride on the next America's Cup boat in 2024 in Barcelona. So all of a sudden I had this opportunity to amalgamate the two worlds in my life that have given me my career and, and everything that I know, like cycling for one, and sailing for another, being wow. out on the water is, is a beautiful who'd, thing. So, yeah, who would have ever yeah. thought that a psych? I mean, <laughs> 20, it's a weird combo. Right? Twenty-five years ago, when you're sailing with your dad and all, thinking about, and then, but then you, the love of cycling kind of took over and gave you a career yeah. path, right? And yeah, now, exactly. after the, all these decades, to bring them the two together, you know, yeah. everybody's wondering. Most of the listeners right now, like, what still? What does cycling have to do with racing a yeah. yacht? So give yeah. us some some background on to how and you mentioned cyclers, I've you know yeah. I've never even heard come with a new name. I've this never is, even yeah, heard of that new. until this week, and that's C Y C L O R S. Correct. So, yeah. Correct. So yeah, I don't know actually who came up with that, but yeah, there's a new word in the Urban Dictionary. I don't know if the UCI has recognised it yet, but there it is. <laughs> it's outlawed by the UCI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably will be soon. We'll wait and see. How tall of socks uh, can you guys wear? Uh, <laughs> that actually, some people have been sporting knee-high socks, so they're <laughs> okay. following all the rules. Um, it's um, it's it's a little it's a little crazy. I think the the most common question for somebody who can't like even like I didn't know at first like what they're actually doing, but they're not spinning a propeller at the back of the boat. That's yeah. the number one answer. If somebody comes up with that question, are they pedaling a propeller? No, it's not the <laughs> point. That's I never even thought about that, but that would be a good one. Right. No. So the rules of the America's Cup, uh, the boat has to be powered by humans, right? So on the boat, we have technical sailors. We refer to them as the afterguard. They're the ones who are controlling um, the, the flight of the boat because now they fly up in the air, yeah. the direction of the boat, and they manipulate the, the sail shapes. Um, so they're the, they're the technical sales, sailors on board. And then in previous editions, they've used arm grinders. So these guys have come onto the boat and they're, they're using their upper body to, to, to move hydraulic fluid and create hydraulic pressure, mm -hmm. which is then what is used to change those sail shapes, to, to make the sail flatter, to give it more of a curve, uh, whatever might need to happen. Uh, and so what happened in 2017 the New Zealanders, um, I don't want to give them too much credit, but they interpreted the rules and realized that there could be a different way to, to do the same thing, and that was to use cyclists, cyclors, on the boat, and the, you know, the muscles of your lower body are much stronger than your upper body, so they came along in 2018 in Bermuda, and they won the America's Cup out there, and partly it was down to the fact that they, they used the, these cyclors on the boat. They then... Um, they put regulations in for the next America's Cup that nobody could do that. So in 2021, nobody did that. Huh. But now for 2024, they've come back in, changed the rule again. And I, I believe that we're going to see most of the teams with, with cyclers, if, if not all of them, for, for the next Cup. What we see is that using the lower body, legs, glute muscles, quads, you know, the, the guys are producing 30 to 40% more power than what the, the wow. upper body arm grinders are doing. Mind you, what the arm, the arm grinders can do is, is phenomenal, like over 300 watts for, for 20 minutes, which is unfathomable for wow. us skinny, puny little cyclists who have never yeah. done too much work, upper body work in the gym. Um, but yeah, so we're finding that um, we can recruit some really big, strong 
cyclors in order to produce a lot of power for the boat which is creating that hydraulic pressure and giving those technical sailors the ability to press buttons in order to manipulate the sail shape and, and uh, you know set the boat up as perfectly as possible. Yeah and in the past with the arm grinders um, they somewhat had to deal with ropes as well and they were more exposed they were more up on deck is that correct and now the cyclors are more hidden in the hole or yeah that, that probably is not so much of, a, of an evolution of that um, in the last few editions of the America's Cup we now have foiling boats it started with foiling catamarans and now we're in a foiling monohull which uh, is the difference between two hulls versus the one yeah. hull and there's basically a little wing that goes down into the into the water on an arm and that lifts the entire boat up out of the water. Yeah, that's the amazing. boat weighs something like six tons. Wow. Uh, and, and this is, it reduces all friction with the water. And of course, water is a lot more dense than air. So by bringing all that boat up out of the water, skimming, well, skimming like a meter above the surface, uh, the friction being so low, they're now attaining speeds of uh, 52 to 53 knots, which is 100 kilometers an hour, uh, close to 60 miles an hour. Right. Uh, so it's phenomenal speeds. And in doing that, the next evolution through that is the aerodynamics as well. Okay. So what we're seeing now is that the teams are uh, circling back around and, and cleaning up the designs of the boat and, and really trying to, to make a really nice, sleek package. Yeah. So how many crew members are there? How many of them are, are cyclors? Yeah, and so this is part of the reason why we're driving more towards a cycle route as well. Last America's Cup, there were 11 people on the boat. Okay. Uh, this time around, we're only allowed to have eight people on the boat. Therefore, we need to produce more power using less people. So for this cup, uh, AC37, America's Cup 30, number 37, we'll have four afterguard, so four technical sailors on the boat, and then four of the power team on the boat. So two cyclos on, on each side of the, of the hull. Wow. Okay, so then how do you go about recruiting uh, this team? What stage are you at right now? Are you, are you down to like a group, then you'll make a final selection, and what is the size of the group, and how did you find uh, you know, these yeah. cyclists? Yeah, so we're pretty a fair way down our, our selection at the moment. Uh, we do have a couple of spots left over that we're still looking for a couple of uh, diamonds in the rough, a couple of golden nuggets out there. Uh, but we've we've found some amazing, uh, I'll call them cyclers because not all these guys came from a cycling background. Yeah. Uh, we're looking for big, tall, strong guys, or they don't have to be tall, but they have to be big and they have to be strong. Okay. So the weight range that we're looking at here is more around the 90 to 100 kilogram mark. Wow. And this is where it's completely different right. to, to world or cycling or, or sort of pretty much all forms of cycling. Sometimes in the track you might get somebody around that weight. Um, but it's pretty pretty rare. Uh, so it really, at the end of the day, the goal is to produce the highest absolute watts that we possibly can. So it's no longer watts per kilogram. It's not watts per CDA. It's just absolute watts, and that, that's what we're chasing here. So what kind of numbers do are you looking for when you're recruiting? You know, what kind yeah. of power duration curve? What does this look like? Um, any specifics you can give around those numbers that you're looking for? So at the moment, we, we have a, a protocol test that we use, and we're, we're putting that out there to, to people who we think might fit the bill. And within that test, there's a 30-second uh, test component, four minutes, and also a 20-minute test. And this is all within like a, an hour-long file. Uh, so the standard that we're looking at at the moment is for over 1,000 watts for 30 seconds, uh, over 540 watts for four minutes, and 440 to 450 watts for for the 20 minute mark. That's that's sort of like our standard of like, let's have a chat. Yeah. Um, some of the guys we've got uh, are pushing these numbers even higher, so we're, we're really happy with, with who we've been able to find. Um, but we're also realizing that it is a little bit of a bizarre story and not everybody knows about us. And we've been stalking a bunch of rowing forums, for example, to, to find these guys. <laughs> and we're looking to, to like infiltrate into some other sports as well so thinking like um you know l lower leg dominant sports so like speed skating or something like that too yeah rowing 
Rowing is a, is a big one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We have a couple of really top rowers on board. Yeah. When you mention these numbers in terms of like a world tour cycling, you know, these are like, oh yeah, that's like almost, that's like winner of the Tour de France. Why aren't you going after those guys? But it's not about power to weight ratio. It's about the absolute power output. So therefore a heavier person, you know, some of these heavier national world-class athletes in rowing, for example, can actually produce the same numbers as a Tour de France rider, but yeah. because they weigh so much, they can't go up the a climb, you know, with exactly. the same speed. Here we are on a boat, they're in the yeah. hull. So aerodynamics doesn't mean anything in terms of how big or small the actual athlete is, right? Mm, exactly. Exactly. The, the biggest difference is the 20 to 30 kilograms in between them, you know. Right. Uh, the, num the numbers are huge. The numbers are, are some of the highest I've ever seen. Uh, and these, are, these guys are world-class athletes. And I'm glad that we've found a niche that, that works really well for them. I'm glad we've got them on board. Yeah. I saw an interview this week with Colton Hall. Is he? Yeah, yeah. And, nice. it, and it mentioned that he has a the two-hour Zwift record. <laughs> and that was, he set that two-hour Zwift record during a workout. And he didn't know he set the record till later on someone told him. And he's like, oh. Yeah. Well, I could yeah. actually beat that. <laughs> your, your, your dad's going to love this because it was a zone two session. Oh, no using way. Decoupling, using decoupling as a metric. No way. And uh, he, uh, and he, he set the two it. hour record on Zwift in a zone two workout. Yeah. Yep. No yep. way. Yep. Wow. Yep. That is amazing. Yep. It's impressive. It's impressive. Carlton is a very impressive athlete. Um, just he looks at a, a, a set of dumbbells and instantly the, the, the muscle just sort of starts growing. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a freak athlete, he's super strong. Okay, I wanna, I wanna break down a couple things, like the, the demands of the actual race, right? And then kind of back into yep. that, like the, the training, you know, that leads into it. But talk to us about the race or a regatta, you know. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah. What are the demands on the cyclists when it comes down to actual race day? Yeah, sure. So we're still not 100% sure what 2024 will look like um, mm -hmm. with the setup of the regattas there themselves. Um, but if we go back and look at how it was in, in Auckland, New Zealand at the beginning of 2021, uh, the races are 20 to 25 minutes long. There's always a start sequence for the boats. like They're always jockeying for position early on in order to put themselves in the most advantageous position tactically. Yep. So there's a lot of intensity in that first part. Uh, and then the race itself works out to be 20 to 25 minutes long, depending on, on wind conditions and things like that. Uh, so that's that's the time frame that we're looking at, and it's likely that it will be two races per day. Okay, so for how many days? Really short. Uh, yeah, it depends on, on how long the regatta is, so it could be... Um, seven days, 14 days, depends on, wow. there's different parts of the America's Cup. The, the first one is the Challenger Series. So all the different um, teams that are entered at the moment, we're going to compete together. Whoever wins that competition will go up against New Zealand as the defenders of the previous America's Cup. So that that's the America's Cup itself, but first we have to go through the Challenger Series. So the, the, the first part will be more of like a round robin style event. Uh, and then the America's Cup itself will be as long as it needs to be for um, a clear winner to be um, awarded. Hmm. Okay, so 20-minute races, yep. maybe up to two a day. Within the 20 minutes, are they pedaling the whole time? Is it on, off? How do they know when to give a big effort? Like, what does the actual efforts look like within the race itself? Yes, so there is uh, basically an accumulator tank on the boat, uh, and this is governed by regulation that has been written for the, the America's Cup rules, and it changes every iteration of the America's Cup. So this accumulator can store pressure. Think okay. about your, your bicycle tyres, you pump up your tyres in the morning. It's exactly how it is, right? Uh, and then with that pressure available, the sailors can use that, the afterguard can use that in order to get direct power to, to manipulate any of the sail shape that they want to. Um, but there also, there also is the ability for 
uh, what the cycle or the power that the cycler is producing to do a direct movement to whichever part of the sail as well. Oh. So there's two functions. There's a stored energy and there's also direct use energy as well. Okay. Um, so it's just a matter of trying to figure out how best to use those, those two components. Okay, so the stored gets used up and they can refill it during the race yeah. as well exactly. as exactly. refocus energy towards a specific um, yep. use. So again, like how, what might those cycling efforts look look like? Are, there, are we sure. talking 10 second yeah. efforts or eight minute efforts yep. or, you know? Yeah, and you can take a look, everything's on YouTube as well. You can go back and look at the, the last America's Cup and, and watch the, the grinders on the boat mm. uh, through the maneuvers. So you're, with, with sailing, for, for those out there who aren't sailors, you have to sail at an angle to the wind. You can't sail directly into the wind, so you're always at a, at a certain angle mm -hmm. and you're sailing diagonally back and forth along the course. Each one of those um, maneuvers is called a tack or a jibe, and that's basically putting the wind on one side of the sail to putting the wind on the other side of the sail. Uh -huh. Each one of those maneuvers is where you start to uh, have a higher demand for instantaneous power. So uh, what we see is that there's, there's perhaps like a 20 to 30 second uh, high intensity effort there and they'll sa then sail along in that direction for up to let's say 90 seconds. This is what we saw in the last America's okay. Cup. And that's when they get to the boundary of the other side of the course and they have to come back again. So so yeah, to, to wrap that up it would be 20 to 30 second effort and then 90 seconds of uh, more of like a, a sub-threshold effort throughout that period of time to, to build up the, the energy reservoir again, the accumulator tank and to be ready to go for that next tack or next jibe. So, so they're pedaling the entire race? There, there are moments where they can really ease off, uh, and there might be some moments where they can stop pedaling completely when that tank is full and when there's no more demand from, from the afterguard at that point. Okay. Uh, but it really just depends on, on the dynamics of the race. It, it's hard to know what, what each race is. So, you know, let's let's say it's close to the whole time, but not completely the whole time. Okay. Uh, and it's like an over-under style effort. Uh, they are aware of generally what's coming up, and part of what we're going through at the moment is having the the cyclers learn more about the the dynamics of sailing, because a lot of these guys haven't sailed before. Right. And all of a sudden, they're on the you know world's fastest, most expensive yachts in the world. Um, and so for them to learn the time, timing and for them to learn um, to preempt when their effort might start is, is an important thing. Mm -hmm. So it's something that they're all um, really paying attention to at the moment. We've, we've done a big sailing block in, in Pensacola, Florida, which is our U.S. base. Um, and then we'll, we're going to reconvene again in, in Barcelona and have more sailing time together. So, ba so again, like this is so fascinating. Someone says, go or now, or some trigger, and yeah. do they then go 100%? Then they go 100%. Okay. They'll also feel the resistance as well. So imagine the hydraulic fluid and the amount of resistance that, that gets um, pushed back through the system towards them. Okay. They, they can feel that, and like if they're just pedaling easy, all of a sudden the bike gets jammed up and they're going to have to ped pedal through that. So they can feel that there's like a direct feel to, to huh. what's going on. As well. To the individual, like, is it like a tandem where there's one chain amongst the, the, the team or is it individual chains? Uh, for the next cup, we still, none of that is decided yet. So it's uh, reviewing everything that we've got for now. Uh, we have SRAM on board. As, Can't as give great away supporters. the secrets. No, they haven't figured them all out yet either. Huh. But uh, it's a very important period of time. Like everything that we've done in the last year has been a learning process about what we put into the next design of the next boat. Hmm. And that build starts starts around this time for, for all the teams. And it's uh, it's a big commitment. You know, we had, there's a, a really big design team behind all of this. And once they pull the trigger on like this is what it is, that's our pathway. That's the pathway that we're going down. So yeah, yeah. We're happy we got some good people in that corner. So you mentioned a brand that cyclists and triathletes would know, SRAM. Um, yeah. where, how are they on board? I assume power meters are involved. Yep. Tell us yep. more about that. All of that. Yeah. No, they're, they're they're great partners. Uh, we have them on on board the boat to to put the bikes together. We have uh, Trek bikes on, on the boat themselves. Trek. Uh, 
Yeah, wow. and we're using using all the SRAM components to, to link all these systems together. We're tapping into their engineers because they're their experts in, in, in cycling engineering, and uh, that's a really great resource for us to have. Uh, but beyond that as well, I have to train these guys too, so I can't stick them on the boat all the time to get the training done. We're out on the road, so okay. we all have our, our treks and, and SRAM group sets out on the, out on the road to, to get in our mileage um, before we get on the boat and, and have to be ready to perform. So um, so it's great to have them along as, as partners. So on the boat, after a race simulation or an actual regatta, you're pulling the data off, you know, that does SRAM have the head unit or what, you know, what's collecting yeah. all this data? Yep. Yeah, so we have uh, the quark power meters on, on board and uh, hammerhead uh, head units as well. Okay. So uh, we have a hammerhead head unit on, on each bike on the boat and that automatically gets sent up into the cloud when we come dockside. We have 5G networks everywhere that's picking up all this telemetry. Like, you know, cycling has a lot of telemetry. Add in millions and millions of data pieces per second for, yeah. for everything that's happening on the boat as well. Um, but yeah, so we're collecting that data from each cycle or on the boat, and then we're trying to interpret that. It's a very stochastic file. It's uh, it's like looking at a Criterium or a Paris Rebay or something like that, okay. where there's like a lot of peaks and a lot a lot of um, chaos almost. You know, it's not there's not a lot of sustained efforts. There's there's a lot of changing power demands throughout um, a sailing session. So, do you have live telemetry? Can you track data live during while they're out on the water? Yeah, yep, yep. Wow. So we'll have um, we'll have engineers keeping a track of all of that. It's it really it's this is aligned with Formula One. Um, a, a few of the teams in the next America's Cup, uh, Alingi have a relationship with Red Bull, uh, and in the past we've we've had we've got a lot of really high level data telemetry people on board as well in order to to look through all this stuff and and try to figure out what what we can derive from the data and continue to learn, uh, continue to practice our processes and, and and shape the boat and shape the sailing as best as we can. So it's, uh, yeah, this is a, a training peaks heaven yeah. for sure. There's Fascinating. You know, and like F1, how many F1 drivers are there in the world? Like, you know, 21, but then you got F2, 3, 4. Yeah. You know, how many cyclers are there in the world today on yacht, yeah. racing Oops. yachts? Not so many. Everyone's waiting, waiting in the wings at the moment. Um, yeah. They're uh, practicing and training on yachts, uh, but we're still waiting for America's Cup next year to, to let them rip it all together and uh, see what they've got. But, but, uh, but man, you know there's going to be a crew of eight, and then half that will be the, the cyclers. Cyclers. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And are they, are they, are you, do you have heart rate monitors on as well? Yeah, I, lo I always love collecting heart rate. I think uh, the you know, the power data is so noisy. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of all the different things that are going through the drivetrain, uh, this is not a bicycle where you have nice smooth inertia from from your wheels on a nice smooth road. This is a cycle or turning uh, hydraulic oil through pistons at multiple uh, degrees on on the pedaling arc. So. There's almost like this eccentric resistance that they feel when they're pedaling, um, and it, it's it's not it's not the most pleasant. There's no feel flywheel effect. No, it's actually against the rules. You, you can't wow. have any sort of a flywheel to, to wow. gain any sort of uh, positive advantage. So got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you mentioned heart rate. In the you also mentioned a decoupling workout. You know this incredible yeah. output and. So let's let's dive into some of the training now. You know, maybe sure. you know from the outside looking in, what's the biggest difference to training for you know the yacht racing versus road cycling? Like, just what's the most obvious difference that you're looking at? Um, you know, as a coach, to to come back to the the beginning of of our conversation, in that we're looking for absolute power. We're not okay. looking for for relative power. You know, I really think. In, in professional cycling or any forms of cycling, you know, I think one of the most important metrics, it's a really simple way to think about it, is speed. The faster you go, the more chance you have of winning a race. And so sometimes producing more power doesn't actually yeah. mean that you win the race. If you're riding, you know, not very smart, riding in the wind, 
you know, all those lessons. Um, maybe the the athlete is five kilograms too heavy because they did a big strength program mm-hmm. and they can't get it up the hill. <laughs> oh, I wish that was me. Uh, it's it's not muscle. Um, you know, it's it's those things uh, that I find are, are the a big big change. And so into having to take that speed component out of it and just think about absolute power. Uh, I look, we look more for uh, force production, okay. uh, and we use the gym uh, quite yeah, a little bit more than what we'd, we would on the road. Um, but then beyond that, the, the physiological systems are all the same, though, as well. So there are a lot of areas where there's, there's massive similarities, uh, but just the end result, when we get to the specificity of it all, the 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 biggest driver is just to focus on these absolute bots that we're trying to get out of the guys so yeah lo- lots of lots of power style um talk manipulation style training okay so what might that example workout be in terms of producing that type of like absolute power and how often might you do that workout uh, again, uh, like everything, uh, that's a, not yeah. a cop-out answer, but it's always the answer that yeah. most people should give. It depends. Yeah. It depends on when it is. depends on where you are in your periodization. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the fundamentals are the same. So we still have to build aerobic conditioning. Um, you know, even for a 20-minute event, it, it's underpinned by the aerobic system for sure. Uh, then I'll use things like strength endurance efforts, whether it's just a, a steady state uh, effort of eight to 10 minutes uh, at low cadence, 50 to 60, or even 40 to 50 RPM uh, up around threshold. So um, just a, a good steady state strength style effort there, uh, or a progressive style strength endurance effort where we're ramping up from uh, super high torque, uh, as low as 30 RPM and, and spinning up through really high demand and then having to um, to vary that cadence into 90 to 100, 110 RPM by the end of that five minute effort. So it's like a, a progressive cadence style effort where you're loading up a lot with, with torque early on and you really feel the leg burn by the time you get through the, the five minute component of that. So Got it. Uh, just creating a pretty wide range um, because the on a bicycle on the road we've got plenty of gears uh it's a relatively controlled environment uh whereas the guys don't always know, don't always know what's going to hit them next right uh some of the loads on the boat um super massive like talking you know multiple tons of load that will uh, all of a sudden be um, thrust down upon them they might not always know where that's going going to come right. so they have to have the ability to be able to to pedal through that and that might be a demand of, of really high torque or very high cadence. So, yeah, just just to create a really wide range for them to be able to respond to. Well, what's unique in this sport as well, it, it's not like a track rider might do their effort, a couple efforts, and then chill and sit back and wait two, three hours to the next, you know, round, right? Here, the cyclist is continually on. They're doing the same watts more or less you know of a like track racer but then they'll have to continue riding and not only that they have multiple races within a single day you mentioned up to two races a day oh and it's seven to 14 days long so this is a stage race where they need the aerobic capability to not only recover from effort to effort within the 20 minute race but then between races and oh multi-day stage racing effectively mm-hmm. so so the aerobic component definitely plays a big part of that um can you substitute in athletes or is it always the same yeah yep no so so we have a team a cycle or team a power team of about 10 at the moment okay 10 or 11 guys uh so we do have um multiple teams that we can move move in and out of there uh and the other component to add to that as well is essentially we could call it a warm-up um, but everything here is driven around the boat, and it's important that the boat, they get the boat out there in the morning, and the sailors, the, the technical sailors, the afterguard, they get a chance to, to get a feel for the conditions, and so uh, we've got to think about that component as well. So it's not just the races that they'll be doing, but it'll also be practice time as well. And um, 
you know, we've been doing all these sailing days in Pensacola, and within that, we'll be out on the water from sometimes sunrise to well, sunrise, or let's say 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, um, and go to a sunset, and they bring the boat in just before the light disappears for the day, because it's not safe to be flying around in a boat at 100, 100 kilometres an hour, 60 miles an hour, when there's no lights. Um, so that's the one thing that makes the days a little bit shorter. Um, but on those days, we'll, we'll substitute the riders, you know, the cyclors, in and out. So Got every it. two hours or so, we'll, we'll put a fresh team on. Um, so there's, there's, yeah, beyond beyond the race day itself, we have to have these guys fit and strong and ready to support the development of the boat and development of, of the, the, the processes that the afterguard need in order to, to dial in their, their sailing skills. So right. there's all of this stuff that comes beforehand as well. Huh. Okay, so you gave a, an example of a really high torque kind of high power workout, but you also also mentioned, you know, this concept of decoupling. You know, yep. dive more into a little more of what you're looking at in that style mm. of of workout. What is the workout, and maybe what's what do you, what's the purpose of it? Yeah, it's uh, something that I've used for for many years. Um, you know, of of you know, listened and spoken with your dad before about using decoupling, sort of just monitoring how. Um, when in a steady state effort, how power and heart rate are interacting with each other. Yeah. Um, I've always been a big fan of having heart rate on board with the power, so it just gives you a lot more context about what's going on. Uh, and I've also done a lot of work with Inigo San Milan over the years, who I know that you've you've spoken to a lot as well, and and uh, you know he's he's had amazing success with with the things that he's done. So mm-hmm. a, a lot of these these uh, these ways of going about it, I've, I've gained from from these guys and, and learning about that over the years and applying that to the to the world tour guys and I really think it's one of the best ways to to push that aerobic conditioning you know to to help those athletes best build their ability to use um, to use fat oxidation as their primary fuel source which is ultimately uh, uh, an infinite source for, for them to be able to compete um, so even if it's an anaerobic a- athlete or even if it's an anaerobic effort that is required to give that athlete an underpinning of a really strong aerobic foundation means that they can go again and they can go again and they can continue to push out those yeah. those really high intensity quality efforts and and you know make no mistakes at the end of the day it's not the aerobic threshold the zone two effort in the race that actually wins the race mm-hmm. it's the really high intensity stuff but this is the foundation, this is everything that we have to put in place beforehand to give the athlete the, the physiological foundation to be able to, to achieve those higher power numbers that, that, that uh, ultimately really make the difference when it comes to race day. So yeah, yeah it's a, one of the biggest building blocks, most important building blocks of the whole foundation. Yeah, well, you think about matches, right? How many matches do you have in your matchbook within the race, you know, and effectively if you build the aerobic engine you have more matches because you can recover from one effort to the next therefore you have more efforts to give so uh it's definitely a, you know a foundation that you're trying to build at, how about on the nutrition side you know during the event itself or you know i assume they're taking in some carbohydrates you know i talked to us about nutrition within the actual uh, regatta itself yeah, so this is something where we're continuing to. Uh, it's something that I'm really trying to bring into the team a lot as well. Of like, in cycling, especially in the last five or ten years, it's something that we've really focused a lot on world yeah. tour stuff and, and really dialing in that nutrition. You know, most teams have four or five chefs and a couple of nutritionists to, to support each rider in their absolute everyday f- fuel intake. Yeah, it is crucial, absolutely crucial for for optimal performance. And that's something that we're really trying to, to step up with. Um, actually, tonight, in, a, in the next couple of hours, we'll be having a webinar with our nutritionist, who's Gemma Sampson, who's, who's on board with us, and going through um, some some nutrition topics just to make sure that the, the guys have good education around this and, and making good choices while they're out there on the road um, or out there on the water, I should say. Yeah. So, I've taken that from the old, old days. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's crucial. You know, you have to support um, these high levels of, of output. You think about it like just talking about uh, Colton Hall with his, his zone two workout, his whipped record, which I, I don't know if do you, do you recall what the what's well is like. Uh, no, I never heard. I didn't, I didn't look it up. 
it was, it's crazy high, but like to push 380 watts for for a couple of hours, it's burning a lot of of calories, a yes. lot of calories, and like the you know, carbohydrate intake that you need to to support that stuff is is huge. So um, teaching these guys on how they can consume very dense, uh, high caloric items in order to support their training, um, whether it's a a five hour endurance ride that we're using for preparation or whether it's a, a long day on the boat. Uh, a long day on the boat would be a lot of shorter efforts where they're doing like a stint of 20 to 30 minutes of sailing then they'll set the boat down, analyse things and then go again 20 or 30 minutes later. But they're doing that on and off for two, three, four hours and then swapping out to, to other people. So there's uh, there's different demands here. There's, there's our our training days where we're focusing on their fitness specifically and there's other days where they're, when they're on the boat learning the systems and supporting what we're doing with the boat development and the sailing development there so uh, we can't cater for every different circumstance so it's really important that we teach them to make good choices so when they're out there on the boat we'll have chase boats that follow them around uh, on there they'll have uh, electrolytes they'll have fluids available They'll have um, high energy carbohydrate uh, items available like uh, Haribo lollies and stuff like that, candies, Um, but also things that are a little bit more substantial, so carbohydrate like protein balls and things like that as well. So um, a good range and they'll even have lunch out there sometimes as well. So within the 20-minute race itself, are they able to drink and take in any calories or sugars Mm -hmm. within the race itself? Uh, I think it'd be pretty hard. They might get splashed in the face a few times from salt water, um, and that might go as far as their electrolyte rehydration solution. Yeah. Um, But in between the races, for sure, we'll we'll give as much support as we possibly can for the guys. Yeah. So what what kind of percentage breakdown in terms of, like, indoor cycling, outdoor, or on the water, on the boat itself? What is the... Yeah. What is it, or, or number of hours a week, you know, in general, and how does that break down? Yeah, it's a, a we could sort of like um, cap this around what we yeah, what, what's the, the life of a cyclo, you know, yeah. that's what does it look like? And you know, we, we've done our six month stint together in Pensacola, okay. uh, we finished that up at the end of February, and that was a really intensive time on, on sailing the AC 75 just to go through some of the nomenclature to, to help understand some of the. The, the terms that are used. So the AC-75 is the class of boat that was used in the last America's Cup and will be used in the next America's Cup as well. It's 75 foot long. That's why it's called the America's Cup 75. Yeah. So that's that's the reason why it has that, that denom- denomination. So that's the full-size boat that, that we'll be racing on. That's what they raced on last time. And within that, we spent that time in, in Pensacola uh, doing our sailing time on that but outside of that would be doing training days as well so to sum it up we'd be doing anywhere from 12 to 18 hours on on the bikes each week um, but they're also doing a bunch of time on the boat as well so we're getting our training in in the morning generally from you know once the sun comes up for for two three four hours in the morning uh, and we'll use the weekends for an opportunity to to get some uh, longer endurance rides in um but it's very much dictated by the wind conditions and the weather conditions that we have throughout that week. Uh, the boats are very high priority, and we need to be able to, to support what needs to happen around that. So um, it, sometimes it's a bit of a day-to-day uh, interaction on, like, what can we do today, and it has to be based around the schedule of the boat. Mm. Um, so what we'll find that we'll sail a few days of the week, let's say half of the week, and the other half of the week we're, we're out on the, the bikes out on the road, uh, and there, some days we're doing some longer endurance rides on the road, and then other days we're indoors on the Wahoo kicker bikes, um, and we'll have the guys stretch out some really big sessions. So the the day that, that Colton broke that, that two hours with world record, that right. was on a kicker bike in a gym that we built out of two containers and uh, some ply, plywood flooring. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, they're really getting the, the, sweat, the sweat lodge, we call it. So yeah. It's pretty good. So when you think about periodization, you know, traditionally you might call them A, B, C races. You know, you have a couple peaks a year, right? One or two. What do you anchor around 
when you think about periodization yeah. for these athletes, it, a lot of it has to do with probably simulation of races, not actual races, but in the yeah. production of the boat technology, you have to focus on that week because you got to like make it look like a race, right? So how would you break down or how are you thinking about the next eight? When is, yeah. what, it's September 2024? That's right, that's right. What are some anchor so points between now and then? Oh, it's such a great question. And it's something that as a coach, it's something that has been one of the harder things for me to wrap my head around. It's like, it's like an Olympic cycle, you know, it's like a three or four year Olympic cycle, right? but with no racing in between. Wow. You know, and that's a very long time to not have a physiological objective for the athletes. Sure, there's a lot of objectives around development and, and design of the boat and, and the sailing time needed. Um, but in terms of relating to the athlete and creating um, a great periodized plan for them to, to you know, be at the optimal level they can be for September 2024, for that to be one long linear line, right, right. You know, I, just, I don't see that as being very conducive. Um, so it's just trying to identify how we can break that up yeah. and create some, some stepping stones along the way, like some sort of uh, process goals or, or mock racing, um, things like that. Uh, in order to really just drive uh, a lot of uh, external motivation for them to, to always be pushing towards uh, a goal that's still within reach. Yeah. Because for me, like October 2024, it's, it's still such a long time away. There's a lot to be done between now and then. But when it gets to the America's Cup in 2024, they always say that the, the, the biggest thing is that everybody wishes that they had more time. Mm. So we don't have any time to lose, but we also need to make sure that we're maximizing everything we're doing along the way, but having these natural breaks within that so that we're sort of like on a, I like to think of it like a, like a, a long staircase, right? So you have a, a flight of stairs and then you have a landing, a flight of stairs and you have a landing. Yeah. That's the way I, I like to, to visualize the preparation here. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that we're constantly, uh, my colleague at uh, American Magic, Baden Cashmore, he's the head of the athletics department and he, he drives all the, the strength development, the strength programming and, and treatment with the guys. Um, we're constantly in communication about how we can create um, some stepping stone objectives along the way just to make sure that the, the guys are really focused and, and, and putting in you know the utmost work all the time. So. Um, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one. Uh, we think we have a, a good plan in place at the moment, but it's something that we're always looking to, to refine even more. Yeah, well, it, you can look at that as being a luxury. You know, you have the luxury of a long planning, planning cycle to actually isolate out different components, you know, of the race or the physiology versus the strength versus psychology and then having them all come together in that symphony, you know, in September 2024. Um, but also like the long haul, you know, thinking about the long game, you know, those yeah. aerobic benefits, you know, most coaches are, are like, my athlete just said they came to me and their A priority races in four months from now. How the heck am I going to get them ready in four months, right? Like you have that opposite, yeah. like kind of luxury where you can really yeah. play the long game. Um, so that's really kind of exciting too, that you have that, that opportunity, I think. Um, yeah. The body gets stale though, doesn't it? You know, like if if you stick in one area for too long, the body and mind get stale. So the yeah. I find the physiological adaptations around a certain component of the physiology, you you know, your rate of return declines over time. And so it's so important to continue to move forward from that. Right. And this is why I just see a really strong importance of having like a little bit of a cycle. And that that's psychological as well. Absolutely. I just I think, uh, you know, just going into uh, a racing style atmosphere where you have this heightened uh, sense of, of, of adrenaline and, and commitment and drive, and uh, I, I see that often take athletes to, to another level. So interspersing some of that style of exposure in there as well, I think, is, is, is super crucial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if some listeners out there, they themselves, or if they know of others that might be able to produce these amazing power outputs, yeah. how can they possibly get in touch with you and submit their training peaks files? <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah. So ben.day at americanmagic.com is my email, email address. So I'd 
love to talk to, to anybody who uh, pushes out some big watts. Um, love to have a chat and and see what we can we can find, and I'd love to tell you the story and and see if they they might be a good fit. Yeah, uh, we we started by um, cold messaging the Olympic Eight uh, <laughs> on Instagram to oh. to see if we could get any bites there. Yeah. Um, so we, we're trying to to make our inroads into the different uh, sports within the, within the US that uh, might hold some some gems for us. Such a big nation with so many amazingly talented, strong athletes that you know we're, we're, we're sure that there's uh, there's some some people to be tapped out there. But you know we're also super happy with with who we found so far. They're they're really strong, incredibly talented guys, and some of them come with uh, engineering degrees and. You know, working for Apple and, and things like that as well. So, it's a super talented group. It's really unique. That's awesome. And a bonus, you get to hang out in Barcelona. It sounds like, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not complaining about that. It'll be good. I was there last week. Uh, it's getting a bit of a buzz already for nice. for the America's Cup for next year. And uh, yeah, it'll be good. That's awesome. Close, close to home in Girona. Well, Ben, it's it's a pleasure. It's been amazing to see you, your progression from pro cyclist to pro cycling coach. Now America's Cup head of performance for American Magic. Um, really cool insights. Awesome. Um, good luck with the next uh, progression up to September 2024. And thanks for so much for giving us a lot of uh, behind the scenes kind of uh, uh, knowledge of what goes into these crazy boats that's really 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 yeah. cool I, I would say uh have a look at the team's instagram account uh there's a lot of really great videos on there yeah. uh, obviously facebook and all that stuff too but uh there's some great insight i, I feel some of this stuff is hard to explain but yeah. seeing what's happening out there it's uh it's phenomenal it's uh you know the world's best sailors the world's best engineers and designers um athletes coming together and and creating something pretty amazing and uh it definitely moves very fast so thanks for the time Dirk. yeah great to catch up very very cool story thanks so much ben thanks Dirk. catch up thanks for listening to the training peaks coach cast visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources seven days